Hey tribe of journeymen and women. So today I am here with you to tell you another very special story, which I actually don't think I have on record yet. And uh, I, it's a story that I do like to tell. And it's about the story of how I opened my Aikido Dojo. You could say there are parts to it. And most likely I will, you know, one day uh, tell you more about the other parts. But today I want to focus on uh, with you on the part of how I specifically opened the thing and how I got a hundred members pretty soon, like in a, in a couple of months. Uh, now, the story actually begins when I was around 13 years old. <laughs> so it sounds like a long story, yeah. but it's a good one, trust me. And uh, I was living in a city which was a troublesome city. So this part I usually kind of have on record. People ask me about my background and that's where I start. And that city was a troublesome one because there was a lot of crime and uh, both in adults and teenagers. So I was often in trouble having to defend myself, having to yeah, defend my, my friends. And, and I was also into the whole Eastern culture. But uh, long story short, I dropped into an Aikido class and I really fell in love with it. And when I was about 14 years old, that's when I, actually when I started when I was 14. And I think I was maybe like 15 or so when I figured that I would like to be an Aikido instructor. And that was kind of a wild idea. Obviously, everybody thought it's a crazy idea and nobody thought I'm going to do it. Everybody thought it's just a dream which is going to go through. And in my country, Lithuania, it's in Eastern Europe, I, it's, it's a big thing to study. People expect you to study, uh, especially if you have a high enough IQ. And I said one of the recent videos, unfortunately, I did. I was in the smartest class of the school, but I was like the most stupid kid between the smart kids. So I was like, if you would compare me with an average kid, I'd be smart compared to an average kid. But in the smart group, I was like the dummy. <laughs> and that wasn't a problem because I, I really kind of owned myself and uh, I, I was popular and I was doing theater and so on. So I was a popular kid. I had no trouble with that, being the dumbest kid between the smart ones. But I wanted to say that you know, I wasn't like exceptionally talented at school and actually hated school. I really didn't like it, like it didn't suit my needs. I was a creative kid and I didn't feel like I belonged there. But uh, because I knew that in Lithuania, you just kind of have to study. There's no choice. Nobody asks you if you want to study. Everybody expects you to study one way or another. And they don't even care so much at what you study, you just have to study. And so everybody was expecting me to do that. My older brother, four years older than me, actually that's a picture of him and me together side by side so he um, he was he did that he studied and and so on and so on but uh, I didn't know what I want to study I felt like there's no profession that suits what I want to do and I got caught in that loop of asking myself so what's the right study for me and the story goes that uh, trying to figure out that kind of actually drove me into you could say like a light depression I think depression is you know it's way more serious than sometimes we give credit to it, so I don't think it was actual depression, but I was really like in a down mood, I couldn't sleep, and I was always kind of in a confused state of what, what will happen with me after I finish school, and then I decided to kind of spend some time with myself, and I made this walk, like a 50 kilometer, it's like I guess 35 miles walk, which is like I went from six in the morning to 11 in the evening, almost all the time walking with terrible shoes, so my feet were bloody. I had to ignore the pain-free meditation. It's kind of funny, I guess, in a, in a sadistic way. But uh, during that time, I asked myself what I want to study, and I realized that the real, the real question is not what I want to study, but if I want to study. And the answer was no. And then I asked myself, so what do I want to do? And I remembered that dream of mine to run my Aikido school, to be an Aikido instructor. And I decided, you know what? That's exactly what I'm gonna do. So I come back home after that trip. I come to my mom and she's washing dishes. I remember that, that moment really vividly actually. And uh, I tell her, you know what mom, I'm gonna move to Japan after school and become an Aikido instructor. And I remember her eyes went wide and she was like, what the heck are you talking about? And that's, uh, I like to say that that's when that two year war started between me and my parents of me trying to prove that I will do it. My parents telling me this is crazy. You should at least finish university first. 
but then I came to the conclusion that no, first I'll do what I want to do, and then if I have enough time, you might be hearing my dog, if I have enough time, I will then study. Never did. I actually never finished university. Stupid me. <laughs> but actually not stupid because I actually never felt the need to. Uh, because I exchanged it into going to an Aikido school in Switzerland, uh, living there for three years and becoming an Aikido instructor. And uh, this will be a story for another day. It's, it's an exceptional story of the whole thing I went through there with the positive sides and the dark sides of the story. But uh, the focus of this story is how I opened my Aikido school. So, so I got my black belt, second degree black belt in Aikido. I became a yoga instructor as well. I learned to teach meditation. And I came back to Lithuania, to my home country. I decided to move to a different city. So I didn't open my dojo in the city where I grew up. I opened it in the city where I was born but uh, I would visit my grandmother there sometimes, my grandparents, but nobody really knew me there. I had like only like one or two friends there, but I knew, I kind of knew the city, but the city didn't know me and I felt it was like a good way to have a fresh start. In my city where I grew up, I kind of had a reputation, uh, good and bad. Uh, I was a very heavily drinking teenager kid at a certain age. I don't know if my parents know about that, so. I guess time for truth. <laughs> but yeah, I was kind of partying a lot and then I went to that depression mode and then like I was kind of a bit of a weirdo. I was all by myself, isolated and kind of just read my books uh, in the corner trying to kind of find the answer. And so I, I went through all kinds of stages and I was quite known, especially amongst you know, teen groups. Uh, and some of the adults and teachers, they had an impression about me, good or bad. And I kind of didn't want to go back to that place to, to you know, continue that story. I wanted to have a fresh start because while I was living in Switzerland, while I was in, in the Aikido school, I really, there was a lot of transformation. I really like learned a lot. I matured. I became kind of and more or less an adult, although still there were, there were so many things I had no clue about life. But, but I became more independent and uh, a bit more mature. And so I felt like I want people to know that version of me, I want to have a fresh start. Why is my doggo making all that noise? I guess my girlfriend is training and he likes to make noises when you train. Anyway, so I come back to Cholet. Tough to pronounce for foreigners, but that's the name of the city, the fourth biggest city of Lithuania. And uh, there, beforehand, there, like five or six years ago, when I thought about the idea before I opened the dojo, about opening an Aikido school, there was nothing. There was no Aikido in that city. Uh, a couple of years before I opened the, the school, what's named the dojo in Japanese, martial arts school, you could say, uh, I heard uh, a friend of mine called and he told me there is an Aikido club. And the reason I say club is because I think uh, there's kind of a difference in the sense that a club is when someone is leading a martial arts school as a side job. So no, it's not a full-time place. You rent some place, you come in and you have your students, you teach, you go out and that's it. You know, the community is kind of, it's a light version of a community. A dojo for me is a full-time place. It's a place where the training is always happening there. You can come before, you can come after and, and there's a sense of, great sense of community. Uh, but, and you could argue, you know, you could have a different definition, but that's my definition. So I say club because that's, that was the def my definition of club. But I thought that's not an issue. And uh, my Aikido instructor also encouraged me and said, you know, he's, you do your thing. He's going to do your thing. There's no space for both of you. It's not about that. And I believe in him. It was the right thing to do. And, uh, but the funny part is I come back to Lithuania. I moved to Shule, to that city. And I'm, uh, it was December, 2011, December, right after my Indian trip, actually, if you listen to that story. And uh, I'm starting to, I, I really kind of dove right into it because I didn't want my old lifestyle to get the better of me. I wanted to kind of create a new lifestyle. I wanted to create a community around me as soon as I can so it would support me. And I would kind of be in my element. And it actually worked pretty well. 
But the funny part of that is I called the guy who was running the Aikido club and I said, you know, I'm going to have a grand opening in the beginning of uh, the new year, 2012, January. I think it was January 7th, the, the grand opening that I had. The unofficial opening was January 2nd. And so I called him up and I'm like, you know what? You should come and we should know, get to know each other. Maybe we'll do some corporations. I think we should be friends. And you know, I was a nice guy. I think I'm nice enough still. And I really honestly wanted to, to kind of, you know, work together. Not like, you know, run the same school, but just uh, have a good connection and support each other. And he was like, oh, well, you know, I'm working that day and I can't come. And I think that that was true. I don't think he was lying. But, uh, you know, he didn't seem like he's enthusiastic either. But then he told me, he said, you know, but don't expect too much from, uh, from making an Aikido community here. And he said, because the way he explained it to me, because nobody needs Aikido in Shoulei. It's like nobody really cares about it. And I thought, that's such a bad way to look at it. You know, it's, and I think it's, in general, I mean, let's say we're not talking specifically about a person so much, but just in general, I think a quality of a profound person is someone who, first of all, asks what I'm doing wrong. You know, so instead of saying, this is wrong, and you know, it's like the people don't understand, and, and it's their fault, just kind of putting the blame on someone else, instead of asking, what am I doing wrong? It's 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 a lack, I think, in, in maturity of a person, and a mature person, a, a profound person, always asks what I am doing wrong. And so it was kind of an interesting moment for me to hear that he's blaming the people. And the bad side about that is that if you blame the people, if you blame something external outside of yourself, coffee time, then you don't have to change anything. You don't change it, you don't have to change. It's like, it's their fault i'm doing everything right that's kind of that kind of that's kind of what it supposes i'm doing everything right it's their fault if they don't change they don't understand i can't do anything about it if you ask yourself what i'm doing wrong then what's the element that is missing in me then there's so much potential for change and that's kind of what i always like to ask myself it's like if i don't have a lot of kids students which in the beginning was the case of my dojo eventually the, the program was thriving but in the beginning, I had very few children students, mainly I had adults, which actually I expected the opposite the other way around. But, uh, but I kept asking myself, so what am I doing wrong? You know, what am I doing wrong? What's, what can I improve? That helped tremendously. As, you, as I told you, it, the kids program thrived later on. I had three, three different kids groups and just packed. But, um, but then his perspective was, it's the people's fault. And uh, when I heard him say that, in, in, I didn't say anything to him, but internally I thought, well, we'll see about that. I'll still, I'll still check. Maybe your Aikido, you know, is not interesting to him. I'll, I'll still see what happens with my Aikido. It didn't discourage me. And I was right. You know, I'll, I'll tell you in a moment how I made it happen. But on January 2nd of 2012, when I, when the first uh, class happened. I, I taught the first evening and it uh, wasn't yet the grand opening. It was kind of a semi unofficial, semi official class. And I had like five of his major students come to train with me and they stayed with me and like, or maybe even seven. I think out of seven, five stayed indefinitely, uh, became my students. And they were like some of his main guys. So that already was like, oh, well, okay, that's interesting. And there were a lot of reasons why, you know, uh, I think I think to a degree they, they made the right choice. They, they wanted to learn Aikido, but they weren't happy about how he taught, but they had no other choice. When he heard that this young guy from uh, went to Switzerland and trained and had a black belt and came back, I think that, that caught their attention that maybe they'll get what they're searching for, and I think most of them did. But uh, the, the way it happened, the way I did it, is first of all, I was super confident. I was working my ass off to become an Aikido instructor for years. So as I said, I was like 15 when I decided that I wanted to become an Aikido instructor. This is my mom saying hi. She's doing gardening today. <laughs> and so I was 15 when I decided to become an Aikido instructor. I thought about that idea and I was 22 when I opened the dojo. I think either 21 or 22, I get confused. Let's say 22. And um, 
So it was like, it took me seven years of hard work, three years of living in Aikido school. I read all the possible books, I traveled, and I did everything that I could to develop enough expertise. And by the time I came back to Lithuania, I took my dojo, I felt, I felt it was the time. I felt I was ready. So I had no doubts about it. All the doubts I had previously, I already eliminated them through years of training and getting ready. So that confidence was a huge boost. And uh, because I felt like, I really felt like I came back with a mission. I had really high ambitions, really high goals. I wanted to change people's lives. I wanted to change and have impact on my whole country. Uh, later I realized I wasn't yet really ready to do that. It's a video, another video I'm gonna talk about. It's like how most of my students eventually abandoned me, which was painful. But that had happened after one year of having a really, really successful start. It's a whole story. But uh, at that day, I, I still had the belief that I can change everything. It was kind of maybe half naive, you know, half uh, youngster's naivete. But uh, that confidence really helped me because I had no doubts about what I'm doing. And I really felt like this is something extraordinary special that I'm going to give you. This is life changing and I need to spread the message. I felt like like as many people as possible need to hear about this. And actually my keto instructor also suggested that to do that and I, I trusted him 100% at that day. So what I did, one of the coolest moments was, I called, uh, I called um, the national biggest newspaper, which I like personally, and it was still 2012, so I guess we st newspapers were still a bigger thing. And I called him up and I said, you know, there's this interesting person I think you should talk about, talk, talk to. And they're like, who's that? And I was like, it's me. <laughs> I was like, you know, it wasn't, to be honest, it wasn't arrogance, but it was just complete confidence. I was like, I really felt like they're gonna benefit from the talk with me. And they got interested and I talked to the main editor. Uh, it turns out we had some people we, we both knew and, and they got excited about the, the, the whole story, especially because I was a young Lithuanian guy who moved to Switzerland to train and came back to teach because at that day a very big problem of Lithuania was, which still kind of is, but, but it was very evident at that day, of young people leaving the country and not coming back for better conditions. And I was a unique case of going out there, having this crazy journey and coming back to give to you know, my people. And so they, they caught off, caught on, caught on the interest and they made this huge uh, two piece, it kind of, it was like on the whole newspaper. Actually, it's interesting. I am curious whether it's somewhere around. Usually my my mom keeps that stuff. So after I finish recording this video, I don't want to cut it out because this is one take video. At the end of it, I'll maybe ask my mom and see if I can show you how it looked. So it was like, it was like two pages with pictures and everything, a huge New Year's article. They wanted to, something positive for New Year's and it just really fit the message. And so a lot, a lot of people read that through the whole country. And then a lot of people got interested because I was like really promoting myself. So I was really going out there and saying, look at everyone, I'm gonna open this incredible thing. And, and people got interested. So I got invited to a local radio show and I gave an interview there. I was invited to a local TV show. So everyone was interested and I, I didn't, you know, back away from that by, by even one bit. And when the day for, the grand opening came, it was like packed. The whole dojo, it was like maybe 60, 80 people, I guess. Like a lot of people gathered, like most people I don't know. And actually when I look back at the footage of that opening, I'm gonna actually put a layover off of it, like how young I looked. And actually funny enough, I had a similar haircut at that day. Beforehand I had long hair. But uh, a lot of them actually became my students long-term students, like devoted students. So I guess my enthusiasm, my passion came through and, and, and people got really hooked on. I did make my mistakes later. It's the next story. But that beginning was like, everybody was just like tuned in and we were all in the zone. We were all, you know, kind of in that flow state. It was like really something incredible now that I look back. At that day for me, it seemed like it was normal. It was natural. Like I was like, oh, this is meant to be. But, uh, but now when I look back, I was like, wow, that was quite something. I can see why people were, were impressed and, and caught on. Um, another part of that story is actually, which is very interesting, is when I was choosing my space, my physical space. So 
when I moved to Shule, I didn't give myself a lot of time to open the dojo because I said I wanted to get the momentum start started. So I didn't postpone anything. I went right into it. And in two weeks, I decided I need to find a physical space to make into a dojo. And at that day, it was actually a very good timing because it was uh, 2000, end of 2011. So it means 2008 was, didn't happen that a long time ago. And the crisis, uh, economic crisis was still there. So rents, a lot of spaces were empty. A lot of businesses failed and rent went lower. So I could afford a good place for a lower amount of money. It was still a lot, but you know, and funny enough, I didn't have, I had no understanding of what money is. Like my, my relationship up to this day, my relationship with money is weird. I don't really care much about money. But that day I had no clue what a thousand is, what, what 2000 is. Now it was actually still local currency, now it's Euro. But yeah, so I had no clue about money, but uh, I finally found one space which I liked. It was like an attic, which funny enough, later I didn't take it, but then it became a yoga studio, which I think is a yoga studio still. So it's funny that something similar still came there. But I looked at that space and it was a good space and good location, but it was too small. In my vision and my ambition and I always used to be an ambitious person. Now I'm still ambitious, but in a more kind of humble and smart way. Beforehand, I was just ambitious for the for good and bad reasons. I mean, for the, for the good or the bad. But uh, I looked at that space and I, I envisioned having 800 students. In my vision, I had 100 students and that was it, like no question about it. And I looked at that space and was like, damn, I don't see 100 people fitting in here. And it was, there were three owners, kind of weird, a little bit weirdos. But uh, I, um, I, I told them like, you know, this is a bit too small for me. <laughs> and, and they were like, oh, you know what? We have this other huge space in a central location, which you might like that. And I was like, okay, show me. And we go to this other super good location. Like uh, it was the second floor, uh, you know, not the first floor, but it was like the very, very center of the city. And I come in there and it's huge, it's 500 square meters. I'll convert and write your number, you know, the American stuff above, but it's like huge. It was actually twice more than I needed. And what we ended up doing with my parents, they helped me set up. We cut the space in, in half and the other half I was kind of barely using because we put a curtain to, to make the, the space look nicer. Uh, but but still, there were like a, it was like perfect, you know. It was like just so big, and I could see 100 students come in there. And it wasn't cheap; it was 2,000 litas. That was local currency. But but I guess right now it'd feel like 2,000 euros. And uh, so for a young guy, that was actually a lot. But I had no clue about it. And they said, okay, first three months, it's 1,500, and then it's 2,000. And I am hyped. I feel internally like my intuition says, this is it. This is the right place. And then the next day my parents come in to take a look and I'm just so passionate, I'm so convinced about it. And I'm like, dad, mom, this is it. You know, and because they were supporting me initially, they, they, they helped me make like, the ambition invest, initial investment because I didn't have my money. Uh, you know, I was about to earn it through this work. So thank you so much to my parents, they're incredible. But, uh, but yeah, so uh, I, um, so they need to make the first payment for like the first month. Uh, and and they're like looking at it they're like, well, okay, okay, they're doubtful, but they, they because of my con conviction, they're like, okay, let, let's do it. But, and then we sign the papers and as soon as the owners leave, my parents, the first thing they tell me, they're like, I think this is a mistake. We shouldn't have taken this place, it's too big. I'm like, mom, dad, stop right here. It's like, and I think it was a good, good smart idea that I said, I'm like, we already took the space, we made the commitment, there's no place for doubt. If like we decided to make it happen and that's what we will focus on. We will we will make it happen. We won't focus on if this is gonna work or not. We won't have any doubts. And and that's what I did. I had full conviction and I made sure that instead of thinking this, if this is gonna happen, I will make it happen. And I think that also gave me that extra boost to really go out there and promote myself, not out of fear, but out of enthusiasm and the sense that I need to fill up this huge space. It was crazy. It's a crazy approach now that I look back. I'm not necessarily saying that you should do it, but it worked out for me. But also, you know, you have to also recognize that 
I've spent seven years preparing for this. I, I lived in an Aikido school for three years and like I did the work before. It's not just about coming in and having faith and everything works. I put in the work as well. And actually just to mention that the first three months I was exhausted the whole time because everything I did, I was just teaching, teaching, teaching and grinding, grinding, grinding. So it wasn't just like I had faith and it worked out. There was a lot of work too. But coming back to the story, so so I decided we will make it work. And my parents, luckily my dad, uh, at the day owned a construction company and he's very good at building stuff. So um, we spent the Christmas and the New Year's Eve just working. We actually slept in that empty space with no heating and we just worked and worked and worked. And my dad worked overnights and we kind of set up the place, it was only 70% set up when the grand opening came down. We still finished the last details later, but I still didn't want to, I didn't want to postpone the beginning. I was like, we have to start now. And uh, some of my friends came from other cities to help. It was like actually very cool that that, that happened. But uh, yeah, so, um, so we filled up the space, we constructed the whole thing and my, my parents made the initial investment. Uh, they helped me buy the, the tatamis, the, the gym mats, uh, kind of for meant for martial arts. And, uh, oh, it's been about around 25 minutes. That's where my brain starts to get fried because of talking so much. So don't worry, I'll, I'll get back to it. So just give me a chance to get a sip of coffee. I still need to finish the story. There's some, still some cool stuff coming around the corner. So, uh, what I wanted to share as well is when we signed the papers and my parents looked at it, they said like, it's like shit, you know, we're going to probably have to support you for the first six months, pay instead of you for the rent, which I know, you know, would have been tough for them, but they were willing to do that, which I appreciate. And, but they thought that that was their kind of thinking that for the next six months, we'll have to support you until you get rolling. And, and this is all, this, this is tough. They were kind of in a low mood. The thing is. I was able to support myself from month one. With the huge impact I made, with the students I, I gathered, with my passion and how much I got them interested in the whole thing, from the very first month, I was already able to pay for the gym, to pay for the space, and to have enough money to make a living. So my parents never had to cover a month for me. Sometimes I, I went month to month, like to zero basis. There were some months where I had to pay, it was the day to pay the rent. I take all the money I, I had. It was like, I had like two euros left. Like I had exactly as much as I needed and I gave it to them and I knew that for a couple of days I'll need to survive with two euros because, uh, you know, it'll take time until my next student will pay for the month, monthly fee. So there were moments like that, but I was never late to pay the rent. I always had it. And I, I, I sometimes I borrowed like small amounts of money uh, from my parents if I needed to cover something, but usually like they never had to support me, fully support me. Without their investment, surely I would be in trouble. It would have been way more difficult, like initial investment. But as soon as they did that, I was on my own and I was able to make it, which is great. So, yeah. Now, you know, if, if you talk about the story of how I maintain those students, and yeah, the, story, the title is, in the first few months, I did gather over 100 students. That includes yoga, which I taught, meditation, which I taught, Aikido, which I taught, kids groups. I had over 100 students. I kept track of the day, which is incredible. Uh, later, things changed. I learned some lessons the hard way. I made some mistakes, and I was only 22 years old. And this is going to be the next episode. In the next episode, I'll specifically tell you about that. But the beginning was pretty rad. I made it a success. And just to let you know, I ran my dojo for seven years until I closed it, which is on record. It's documented on my martial arts journey channel. But, uh, but uh, it, they were all successful. I mean, I always made the money. I lived doing what I love, but, but there were up, ups and downs more emotionally, the lessons I had to learn, my separation with my keto instructor. So that's to come in another story. But, but that beginning was pretty fantastic. And I think it changed a lot of people's lives now that I look back, including my own. So I hope you like that story. I think this is where we will end it. Uh, but if you have any questions, if you want me to tell a specific story about another element, like how to maintain 100 students over seven years, 
which I had to learn as well, or, or anything else, let me know and I'll be happy to answer. And I'll also search for that newspaper. So thank you for staying and as always, keep questioning.